Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, whether you're listening live, give us a hashtag live or hashtag replay if you're catching the recording. Um, I'm super excited to do another podcast episode for the Let's Talk About Layoffs uh, podcast. Um, and I have two amazing guests with me who are both career coaches and have recruiting experience, whether currently or past experience. And we're going to talk about all things looking for a job from a career coach perspective, from a recruitment uh, perspective. Um, and what I'm going to do first before we dive, we have some questions that I'm going to go through with Ellie and Katie, um, but I want to give them both an opportunity to introduce themselves. And if you are listening live, feel free to drop a question or a comment in the chat or just a note to say hello. Uh, we would love to be able to say hello back. So why don't we go ahead and get started with Ellie? Ellie, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Ellie. It's great to be here. Um, I My past experience is in recruiting, um, but that is in the past now, and I have now transitioned into a full-time career coach. Um, I specifically work with organizational psychologists. Um, however, I also help my friends all the time. So even if you're not in organizational psychology, I'm sure I can help out. Um, and yeah, very excited to be here today. So thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and then Katie, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you so much. Just like Ellie said, for having me. Super excited. So I actually, I've been involved in hiring in some way, shape or form for about a decade. Um, but I have done both internal recruiting and agency recruiting. I'm currently back to internal recruiting um, right now. So I'm a corporate recruiter. Um, but I'm also a career confidence coach. So I specifically focus on helping women in their job search and just um, how to articulate the value that they kind of bring to the workplace and, and kind of step into that job confidence, if you will. Um, so I'm happy to, to be helpful from both sides of the fence, I guess, um, offering a kind of dual perspective there. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. And even though Ellie and Katie both have um, their specialty or areas of specialty of who they might help with their coaching business, that doesn't mean that the feedback, the tips that they give you, the answers and experiences wouldn't apply to more people than just the audience that maybe they're focused on. So please keep that in mind as you're listening. Um, so let's start out. Uh, my first question is, how did your experience as a recruiter shape your approach as a career coach? So who wants to start with this one? I'll go. Um, so really, the reason that I pivoted specifically into career confidence, um, that was shaped really heavily just by my experience. As I was doing phone screens and interviews with candidates over and over and over again, I would um, just catch little things in conversation. Uh, maybe they were selling themselves short or maybe in conversation, they would mention this great applicable experience that was nowhere on their resume. And I was like, wait, that's the stuff the hiring manager wants to know. Where's that? Um, or I would have, you know, individuals who would just really kind of shortchange themselves in terms of salary. And so then, um, you know, I'm kind of walking them through through that process, but I'm internal. So, you know, I'm trying to navigate that very delicately, but still um, advocate for a candidate experience. Um, so just seeing those things over and over again and seeing how I could help. Um, and then combined with, as I became a recruiter, I started spending a lot more time on different social platforms. And I see a lot of individuals providing a lot of advice that is just confusing or um, very blanketed and not applicable to everyone. And then I saw job seekers kind of struggle with that. And I, I was like, you know what, at the very least, I can offer at least what's true from a recruiting perspective and kind of put everything else to rest or identify them as preferences rather than like the law. Um, so that's kind of what I'm passionate about and, and why I got started and kind of made that pivot, even though I'm doing both at the same time. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And I think there are some people that believe like it has to be this way, like recruit, all recruiters are the same. And I think that's a big myth buster <laughs> that I want to break is they're not. Um, so. Thank you for that, Katie. Ellie, do you want to talk about that? Sure, absolutely. So in 
my transition from recruiter to career coach, I experienced the same things as Katie of having those interviews where I would see folks short short selling themselves. Um, I would often have candidates that I really liked personally um, who would make very common interview mistakes. Um, you know, saying things that would take them out of the running. So I did full cycle recruitment. So I saw them from start to finish. And, uh, you know, I, I really developed a, a strong relationship with my candidates. Um, when I, as soon as I got their resume, talked to them on the phone, really liked them. And then, you know, maybe I would move them forward into the hiring manager interview and then something would happen along the way where um, it didn't work out. And I wanted to so badly give that candidate who I'd built that relationship with, you know, the feedback that they could use moving forward. However, I was restricted in doing so based on um, company policies and best practices. And over time, that really started to get at me. <laughs> and not not to say that every company is like that. That's so not the case at all. Um, however, that was the experience I had. And so over time, that really started to wear on me more and more until eventually I said, okay, I'm going to transition into career coaching. And I actually started career coaching as a volunteer. So only through recruiting did I ever get the opportunity to volunteer. Um, and then that became my experience with career coaching. And I absolutely loved it. It completely filled my cup every time I got to do it as a volunteer. Um, so now I'm very blessed in that I get to actually make a living off of what I love to do as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so let's get in. I think this is a really good question. Um, so what are the most common misconceptions that people have about the recruitment process? Ellie, you want to start us off on this one? Sure. I see Katie giggling because I, know. <laughs> I, think, I think we're both in the same boat in that there are a lot. There are a lot of misconceptions. I think maybe the one that impacts people the most is the, the conception or the idea that all recruiting processes are the same. Recruiting processes vary so greatly from company to company, from industry to industry, the, the type of role that you're in, whether it's entry level, associate, mid, senior, even within the same company, uh, there's different levels, there's different recruitment processes. So what I see a lot of people do is, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll get an invitation to interview for company A, and then they will assume that their interview for company B will be very similar. Uh, when in fact, those recruitment processes are entirely different. Um, and so they will prepare for company A the same way they will for company B. Um, they will tell the same stories to company A that they do to company B when in actuality, it might be a better strategy to really assess what their recruitment process is. Um, and so that would be probably my number one that I want everybody to know is that all recruitment processes are very different. That was a good one. Thanks. Right. I'm now trying to think keep of like, <laughs> I'm like, what's that? I don't, I don't know what's number one for me. Um, there are so many. I, I think one thing to consider is really um, articulating the difference between agency recruitment and internal recruitment. Um, so especially when you're kind of reading these like job boards and these social networks and things um, there's like, this idea that we're spamming your resume to like places that they don't belong. And like, obviously an internal recruiter would never do that. Most agency recruiters that act with integrity wouldn't either, but just this idea, um, th there's an idea that like, we want you to make less money for some reason. Um, there's, um, you know, that the follow-up process uh, should be different. You know, there's a lot of the term ghosting and, and things like that. And um, I think that those situations vary but person to person, but also um, those situations are handled differently with an external agency versus an internal recruiter. Uh, I also think there's this idea that the recruiter gets to make the decision. And it's like, but you we have the best conversation. And just like Ellie said, that's probably one of the hardest parts of recruiting is that you do really enjoy these people. 
I am thinking of roles that they would be great in, but I just don't have that role available at the time. And so certainly I consider them and we try to talk about transferable skills and things like that. But at the end of the day, it really is up to the hiring manager. And I can certainly apply some pressure in terms of like timeline and things like that. But at the end of the day, they really own that. And so I, I would probably just give some recruiters some grace in that regard because there's a lot out of our control that I think the general public thinks that we own and we just we really don't. And we wish we did, but we just don't. So let me ask, I have a question for both of you um, based on your responses. So Katie, first with what you were saying um, about the high, or the recruiter does not make the decision. They're not the decision maker at all. Do you feel like the recruiter has any influence or an amount of influence on the hiring manager as to which candidate to hire? Oh, yeah. So especially more so internally, I think uh, I've worked, like I said, both agency and internal. Um, agency not as much but internal i can definitely point out some things um you know in regards to like oh well maybe you could consider this type of experience because you know joe down the hall has that experience and look look how great he's been doing or or kind of tie it to things that they relate to to make them kind of think it's their idea but um really just help them to to consider some outside things um, I'm currently in a role now where they've never had internal talent before. Um, I oh, truthfully have no idea how they've gotten to where they are um, as a company as a whole. Uh, but they, they have no internal talent, no ATS, no anything. And um, so I'm consistently just even having to like talk about best practice and like candidate experience and um, basic requirements and like, oh, well, you you listed this, this and this. So if... If I said, okay, we don't talk to anyone who doesn't have this, would that be okay with you? And they're like, oh no, because we would also consider this. And I'm like, see, now we're getting somewhere and <laughs> kind of walk them through it. So I definitely think that, especially from an internal perspective, you do have a lot of influence. You just don't get to make the final decision. And every hiring manager, of course, is different too. Like they don't have to listen to best practice. They don't have to listen to me. They don't, you know, they can kind of act with autonomy. Uh, but I think that's kind of the cool part about internal recruiting is that I get to build those relationships so that they do trust me and, and take at least some of my suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And then Ellie, the question I had for you, you were talking about not all recruiting processes are the same and being able to understand maybe how recruiting works in one organization versus another. Mm -hmm. What would be, and maybe not so much an internal candidate, but an external candidate to a company, like how might they even get to know that? So like I know with Amazon, you can go to their site and they have like more information about their interviewing processes and things like that. But how do you go about that when there may not be a ton of information out sure. there? Absolutely. This is going to sound really simple, but I think not everybody will do it. And that's ask your recruiter. Mm -hmm. What are the next steps? Um, what can I expect in this interview process? Um, those are questions that when I got them as a recruiter, I'd love to answer because it showed me that that candidate was invested in the process wanted to prepare for what was next. So sounds very simple. Uh, simple is great though. Just ask. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> uh, so moving on, and Katie, you had started to bring this up about the ATS, uh, which is the applicant tracking system. And this was a question that we actually had in the group when I asked if there were questions for us getting ready for the podcast. Um, so the first part of this didn't come in the group, but I wanted to see if between you both, we can talk about what is an applicant tracking system. And I think there's also a lot of misconceptions about what it is and what it isn't. Um, this person specifically was asking if reader, recruiters strictly rely on it to filter out the candidates. Um, so let's just start first with, let's talk about ATS, what it is, how it works, and then we'll kind of move to the next part of that. Sure, I'll start if that's okay. Um, so the ATS, I like to explain it to people like a folder on your desktop that just holds all of the resumes. And just like you can search a folder on your desktop by keywords or by whatever, you can search an ATS the same way, but it is essentially a fancy filing system for resumes that is divided by 
requisitions or jobs, those would be like the folders in your, you know, in your document area on your computer. So uh, that's, I feel like that's like the easiest way to explain it um, from a non-recruiter perspective. Yep, awesome. spot on. Applicant tracking system. Um, I think there is a, a great deal of confusion around it being an applicant tracking software and what kind of automations are, are available or being used. I think a lot of that comes from the content that we consume on Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, um, and there being, unfortunately, either disinformation or misinformation about it. Some people come from a good place of trying to help, but they don't fully know, <laughs> what, never have worked in an ATS system, and they're making assumptions. Um, but uh, yeah, what Katie described is spot on. It's like, a tracking system where we keep track of the progress of the candidates and the applications that we have. Um, I will say that since my experience is past, I only know what I experienced in those uh, in those years of recruiting. So I don't know what things look like now. Um, however, in my experience, we did not use any automation whatsoever. It was completely manual um, review of resumes and applications. Uh, again, I can't speak for all companies or what it looks like nowadays, but in my experience, that is, it was all manual, all human touch. So when you talk about that, Ellie, did that organization have an ATS, but you had to go through each mm -hmm. of those pieces? Okay. Yes. So you had to go and, each of Whereas yeah. an ATS could also have an automation component where it helps to kind of organize information or filter them out. Is that true? No. I don't, okay. not that I ever used um, okay. the, most of the, the companies I've recruited for were large enough to have an ATS. There's only been one company that I've done recruitment consulting for that does not have an ATS. And that is because they're incredibly small. They have six, seven employees total, but, uh, yes, the larger company that I've worked for. So over, over 500 employees, they do have an ATS, but no, not in my experience, uh, any automation of filtering or, or, um, reviewing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, and maybe this is Katie now, like if you have a role and you have, let's say 200 applicants come in for this one role, are you having to handpick and go through each of those or how, what's that process look like on the back end? Yes and no. So okay. what I will say is, and, and the reason I was shaking my head is there is automation that can filter but it has to be manually set up and input by the recruiter. And okay. even then you still have all the resumes in front of you. Like you still, they're all still in the folder. Mm -hmm. It's just that you can sort by different things um, to narrow the applicant pool or what have you, but it's never, there's not an ATS system that just eats all the resumes and then only shows you four out of 200 because they weren't qualified. I still go through every single one. Wow. And if they are not qualified, I just send a polite, you know, no, thank you. Um, and if they are qualified, then we have a conversation. Now, I will also say that there are knockout questions. This is another hot topic all over LinkedIn. And those can be set up in the ATS by the recruiting team. And those questions align with the requirements of the role. So there should never be a knockout question that isn't also a requirement. That would not make sense. So for instance, if my company could not sponsor a visa, I may ask, do you require sponsorship? And if the answer is yes, then the ATS would not get rid of those resumes. Mm -hmm. They would just put them in a different bucket that I would still review, they would still get a notice from us and all of that. So it's never that they just disappear and then a recruiter never sees them. I just know, uh, for instance, uh, are you available nights and weekends? Well, if it's a role that requires that and they say no, then I say, I'm so sorry, this role isn't a fit for you. Here are some other things you could consider. And you can gotcha. set up those emails to say kind of whatever you want. You can send them one at a time or you can do a template. I know a lot of people don't like templates, um, but just because you receive an email that may feel like a template or something like that, 
that doesn't mean a recruiter didn't see your resume. They, they did. Um, so that's, I think that's kind of the misconception. Um, it doesn't take a recruiter very long to review a resume, like six or seven seconds sometimes to, to do a quick scan. And then, um, kind of a deeper dive obviously takes a little bit longer, but we do, we do have all of them. So even if I search like, um, I don't know, business analyst or something, that's terribly vague, but you get the idea. <laughs> if I search that, I'll see all those resumes, but all of the other resumes are still there and they still have to be gone through. Like they don't just disappear. I think that's the, the biggest part of the myth is like, if you don't beat the ATS, you just disappear into thin air. Yes. Mm, that doesn't happen. I've heard that a lot, beating the ATS. <laughs> That's not a thing. So the the yeah. ATS doesn't even score somebody to say like this would they be like can. top five or ten percent. Okay. Some ATS systems. Now I will say I have worked at companies of all sizes, just like Ellie, and we've actually never even looked at the scores at any company okay. I've worked for. But okay. there are some ATS that will rank candidates. But again, that just puts the resumes in order. You still have still to go, have through, to them go all. through them. Yes. So someone is still reading your resume. Um, I will say we are about to get a new ATS that is very fancy and kind of futuristic, if you will. Um, and it does have some AI <laughs> capabilities, but that actually helps only with the sourcing. So it actually connects with LinkedIn and will like search your LinkedIn, which is why it's great to have an optimized LinkedIn, by the way. Ooh. Quick plug. Um, Love but that it will search your LinkedIn and show me candidates that might be interested in work that have those keywords. But again, it does not move anybody's resume. It does not do any of that. It just simply helps me find candidates a little easier. So it will actually do that. Like I won't even have to enter a search. Once I log into the ATS, it will be like, Hey, we saw that you posted this sales job. Here's 25 people that might be a fit. Okay. So it's helping save time in that way. But again, never deleting anyone without consideration or eyeballs on the resume. Okay. All right. And then when you, we hear a lot about having certain buzzwords or keywords in, so the ATS catches them, is that really the ATS catching them or is that the recruiter as they're scanning through them? It's the recruiter. Okay. Yeah. Again, you can search by keyword, right. but there's, yeah, that, that kind of um, bugs me, but I will say this. If you are writing a resume based on the job description, which you should be, it will already have the key terms in it because there's there's not just one term for something, right? Like, you know, communication, which we don't put soft skills, so that's kind of not relevant. But anyway, like communication, for example, you know, someone might say like public speaker. Well, we wouldn't discount them just because they didn't say communication. Obviously, if they're successful in public speaking, you know what I mean? So right. things like that. Make the connection. Um, I, so I think people are really hung up on the keyword thing um, mm -hmm. so much so that they're like putting white font behind their resume and please never, ever, ever, ever do that. It makes it look really ugly on our end when you upload it that way. Um, and it's not necessary. So yes, a recruiter is looking for keywords. I will scan and look for keywords myself. Or the ATS could say, here are all the ones that included, you know, whatever software, D365. I just look, I just did a roll with that. Here are all the ones that included that. So I might start there, but again, I still got to go through everybody else too. Gotcha. Gotcha. So when people worry about why is it taking so long to hear back, <laughs> there can be hundreds and hundreds of applicants that you're having to go through and kind of figure out who moves on to the next, the next role. So it sounds like based on what you're both saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, is when the person in our group asked, do recruiters strictly rely on ATS to filter the candidates? You are looking at that on, that's your filing cabinet, Katie, like you said, and you're going through each of those. So not necessarily filtering it or, you know, you are looking at everything, scanning to make sure that the right things are there. Yes. Unless, again, with like the knockout questions, mm -hmm. I won't always... Even then, though, sometimes I'll just double check because some of them are like, I don't know, because that's just the person I am, I guess. But sometimes um, knockout questions can like trip people up. Like if they're worded, I'm very clear if I use them. I'm very crystal clear. Like, you you know, do I click yes or no? But some of them are worded 
kind of tricky and you're like, wait, what? Like you're asking me, am I, am I not willing to do a background check? No, wait, what is that? Yes or no. And so, um, if, if they are using knockout questions, it is possible that you will go to like a no pile and you would still get reached out to like via the system, like you, an email would still come to you, but that's why it's really crucial that you read those questions and, you know, answer them truthfully. Um, but otherwise, no. And even then, again, there's a folder that literally says like disqualified upon questionnaire or something like each ATS okay. is named something different, but similar. And I can go there and I can see all the people who click yes or no. And that way I can read through, like I've had people who I recommended for a role and I'm like, wait, why are they not in the ATS? Um, I don't, by the way, I won't recommend someone for a role that I'm specifically working. I'll have another recruiter step in, but I'll say like, they'll say, Oh, Katie, your friend never applied or whatever. And I'll be like, yes, they did. I know they did. And you review the knockout questions and it's because, you know, they, they misclicked or you something like that. So they still don't disappear. No one eats resumes. I promise. <laughs> They're not like the socks in the, the washing machine. Right. Disappear. It's not like you always come out with the half of one. Like, no, it's, right. <laughs> they're they're always there somewhere. Right. Right. So I know all recruiters are different and kind of how they go, you know, work through their process. But I even know from applying for jobs after I was laid off that I like you had mentioned, Katie, before ghosted, like you don't get a rejected, you don't hear anything or like there was one that sat there for like, I think it's still listed as like I'm in review or whatever it is. So what's happening with those? Like, are they, the recruiter may just be waiting or they may not be doing, like going through everything? Like, thoughts on Yeah, that? I'll speak to this one if I can. Okay. Um, because this pulls in not only my recruitment experience and career coaching experience, but also my recruitment consulting experience as well. What it comes down to a lot of the times is either a lack of standard operating procedure or a, um, misunderstanding of the standard operating procedure. So what does a company do? What does the organization, the recruiter, the recruitment team do when a position closes? So in past companies I worked for where I was very proud of our recruitment strategy, we would close the position, take it offline. We would send an email to all the candidates to let them know that unfortunately the position has now closed, um, but they are welcome to um, continue to look at our openings or um, consider us again. Um, but what I found from my recruitment consulting is a lot of those processes aren't in place. So they'll fill the job. And then especially if it's the manager who's managing the requisition, not a, a recruitment team, they will move on to their other priorities. So they've got 43 candidates in their in their bank waiting to be reviewed that's not a priority. And so it's not going to get touched until the next time they open a position. Um, gotcha. So it's a lack of organizational procedure and structure, um, which unfortunately, there's only so much you can do to get around that. Um, what I will say is that if you are applying for a company where that's happening, um, you might be saving yourself a little bit because that, that might be a company that struggles with lack of organization and lack of process and might be a frustrating company to work for. So see it as a blessing in disguise, if you will. Right. <laughs> and I know I've seen too where people have said like nine months later, they get a rejection notice and it's like, yeah, yeah. I kind of got that. So it sounds like when that person had to go back in, they might have closed it out so they could move on and do something else. Yeah. Or they have hired a recruitment consultant who has gone, oh, you have 2,000 candidates who have never been touched before. That's and they all at once get and them out. And then my heart breaks in five different places. Um, and I'm like, okay, we're going to we're gonna put in a standard operating procedure now so that this doesn't happen again. Um, but yeah, it's, it's tough. Oh, wow. So yeah. it sounds like just from our discussion about ATS, which is really good, is that it's not this big, hairy, scary thing. It's like Katie mentioned, it's the filing cabinet with the folders and it's the recruiter's responsibility to go through those and see who are the right candidates. And you mentioned that, like the knockout questions that automatically put you, not dispose of you, but you're put in a different spot so the recruiter can take a look at you. 
All right. Anything else to add about the ATS before we go on? Just one thing um, that I didn't mention and Ellie just kind of reminded me um, and she kind of mentioned it too. Just remember that not every company does have recruiters. So like for instance, I mentioned, I don't know how my company got as big as it did as quick as it did without anything. There are still many divisions of my company where the hiring manager is in charge of at all hiring for their own roles and it will take too long. And then they hire internal talent to build a process. That's what I'm doing. And then that's why you're getting the email really late because I'm like, oh, wait, no, we're not going to just leave that sit. We got to let people know. And they're like, Katie, we can't do that. Like, oh, but we're gonna. So um, <laughs> it's just important to remember sometimes that like not every company even has internal recruiters and, or, or processes or anything of the like. And so that's another reason that it can take a really long time. Um, so, and I will say that while it could be a blessing in disguise, uh, there are some companies that are like in transition that are working on it. So don't give up on them some sometimes, um, unless they're like um, completely obnoxious and rude. But um, I, 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 I'm very proud of the companies who have identified that they have a gap and are doing something about it. Uh, and that's not always apparent on the candidate side when you apply and you're just like, oh, this is taking forever. There are some companies that are doing their best to fix that situation and, and make it right and prioritize candidate experience. So um, it's kind of, you kind of got to take it with a grain of salt and learn which ones are intentionally improving and which ones are absolutely not. And then to Ellie's point, avoid those that are absolutely not. Mm -hmm. I also want to add to, I think something that we've briefly touched on that I want to touch on more is the, the fact that the content that is going to go viral is the stuff that's going to scare you. So that's why the content mm -hmm. about ATS being this big, scary thing um, goes so viral because the, the comments that get added to it, um, the way people read it and go, oh my gosh, this is, this is brand new information. That kind of stuff is going to go viral. So whenever you are consuming content about recruitment advice, job seeking advice, whatever it is, I always tell people adopt, adapt, reject, adopt what resonates with you, adapt what needs to be, you know, adapted for your own strategy, reject what doesn't resonate. And that is okay. Even though the person who's posting is a quote unquote expert, it is completely okay to reject their advice. I, I am completely okay with somebody rejecting a piece of advice that I give on LinkedIn if it does not work for them. So that is my other kind of a little shifted topic, but all important to know. I like that. I like that. Even on LinkedIn, I read something this morning and I was like, oh, I like, I don't know that I agree with that. And I started to read the comments and there was for and against. Mm -hmm. And I was like, agree to disagree. Like, yeah. I, you know, and yeah, move on. Move on. Yeah. So I had a question that came out of this. I'm trying to think of what it was now. Going back to it. Oh, so. My question is, um, how um, long after somebody applies for a position, is it reasonable to reach out to the recruiter if they do have that contact or reach out to the company and ask about a status, like without sounding like an annoying person, like from a recruiter's perspective, I guess, what makes sense? Go ahead, <laughs> <laughs> Neither of us want to take this question. Um, no, it's, I think it's so nuanced um, and it's very, like, it's recruiter specific. The one thing, if nobody gets anything else from this call, the one thing I hope people hear, at least for myself and most recruiters that I know, even if something is not our preference, that doesn't mean that you're getting less treatment or less consideration. So please consider that before I answer. I will say that the recs that fall under my guidance now, they can expect at least an initial, hey, we got your resume and kind of here's what we're doing with it within two business days. Okay. However, I work for a very large company and there are not recruiters for every requisition. And so what is happening now is that people are reaching out to me about roles that I have no visibility to. And I'm in like hundreds of messages a week 
that I don't, that I can't see. So I would say you could ask maybe within a week, you know, I, I would say, or maybe like if you apply on a Monday, follow up on Friday or the following Monday and just say, Hey, just following up. But I would also just ask that you extend grace. And like, if they really don't know, it's not because they're trying to blow you off or, or anything else. They like truly might not know. Um, so just keep that in mind. I, I like when people follow up with me, I like the reminder I'm human. So it's mm -hmm. fine. Like it's, it doesn't make me angry or anything like that. But if you're rude about it, because I don't know, then that's when it becomes kind of like, Oh, Hey, you're kind of burning a bridge here. Like I don't want to be the bearer right. of bad news, but, um, so I would say, you know, sometime in that week or, or the following week, um, just a kind follow up, but I just would be really mindful of your tone and kind of how you respond to whatever they answer you. Gotcha. gotcha. Right. Absolutely. So I have two thoughts on this. My first one is kind of going back to what I was talking about earlier about asking. Um, so when you ask about the process, you can ask when you can expect to hear back and then you wait until you've been told <laughs> that you can expect to hear back. So one of my pet peeves was when I would tell something, yep, we'll get back to you within a week. And then the next day they're like, Hey, any updates? It's like, <laughs> told you it'd be a week. So please right? wait a week. Um, then, uh, oh, oh, what was the other thing? Oh, it's gone now. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'll remember it. <laughs> but that that's my main thing is like, don't follow up before you're asked or before you know that you should. Um, right. But I, I definitely agree with Katie's um, point about the tone that you use. That is critically important. Oh, I remembered it. It's um, think of the recruiters as on your side. Like they're not the enemy, they're on your side. So something that I often said time and time again as a recruiter was like, I want to fill this requisition. Trust <laughs> me, I do. It is my job to fill this requisition. Um, even though in my recruiting experience, I, I was not commissioned. I did not have like specific KPIs to meet or anything like that. But it was my job to fill the requisitions and I liked when they were filled. Um, right. So I need your patience while I try to fill it. I promise that I want to fill it. <laughs> so um, yeah, think of the recruiting team as like your cheerleaders and people who who want you to um, get hired. You know, they're they're a part of your team. Yeah, I like Long that time. too, especially in like some people can be in such a vulnerable state of yeah. maybe they're not already in a job and they're desperate to find a job or they've been laid off and they're really trying and they keep getting rejected. So just making sure that they understand like that recruiter, like you said, they're your cheerleader. They're trying to support you. They're trying to fill the position with the best person possible, but also they might have all these candidates and give us some time to go through them. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So let's see. I know we have a little bit of time. Let me skip down to one of our other questions. Um, so what are some red flags that candidates should look out for in job descriptions or interviews? And one of the things I like to tell my clients is you are interviewing the company as much as the company is interviewing you. So are there some things that maybe a hiring manager or a recruiter can give off or the job description itself can give off that people might be like, mm, I might want to pass on this? So I hesitate to give a blanket statement here because I think that it's so highly dependent. So for me, Personally, for me, I consider it a red flag if a job description has anything about being a family in the job description or the or the company um, values. However, I've had clients who absolutely love that idea and they're all about it. And for them, I'm happy for them. For me, not my vibe. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I struggle to give like a blanket statement what I will say is likely a red flag is if it's very vague. That to me says that they don't really know what this role is going to be. And so since it's vague, they can get away with once you get started kind of changing up the responsibilities because there was no clear description to begin with. Um, so I'd say, number one, it is dependent on your, your own values and what you want. So determine for yourself what is a green and red flag, yellow flag. and then. Um, be very wary of vague statements. The more specific, the better. Awesome. 
I agree wholeheartedly. Um, I think that there are some companies that word things in a way like with the best intentions. Um, but like, it's not saying what you think it's saying, friend, like fix that. Um, and so I would say like, you know, just like Ellie said, like, it's going to be so dependent on you um, as a person. A few things that I don't love seeing. Um, I don't love if it like says it's remote, but then in the job description, it says that you have to be there in the office so many days a week or a commutable distance to the office. Um, here's the thing, like my company, we don't offer remote roles, but that's clear. Like it has the location. So it's, um, you know, it's not an argument for or against work remote or anything like that. It's just about transparency. Another thing I don't love, um, if they do post the salary, if the range is like a hundred thousand dollars, uh, um, but I will also say that you can have that conversation with the recruiter in the very first phone screen. You can say, Hey, I noticed this was a salary. Where, what are you targeting here? Um, or you can say, and, and my favorite thing to do, which is kind of controversial, but I tell them exactly what I'm expecting. Uh, you know, I say like, Hey, you know, this is kind of market value or based on my research, this is where I want to land. I know for me what I want it to be. And I'll just say, you know, I saw your range started quite a bit below that. I don't want to waste anybody's time. Are, are we going to be able to get to this number or not? Um, and the recruiter should be able to articulate with you what that target is, what the range is and things like that. And they, if not, they can at least explain why it's such a wide range. And that will help you understand where you might fall on it. So like, for instance, if it's a huge range at the top of the range, they'll say, well, if you have your PhD plus five years of experience or something like that, like if that's relevant to the role and you know, like, oh, well, I don't have that. So I'm probably going to fall somewhere a little bit lower. And then you just decide for yourself if that's a fit or not. Um, and in terms of like the, we are like a family, or I also cringe a little at certain DEI statements. Um, but my advice for that would be if those are things that are critically important to you, just ask for examples, ask, oh, great. I see that this is, you know, you listed this all over your website. It was in the job description. What have you done in the last three months to move the needle forward on this? What have your diversity efforts looked like? Um, what does inclusion look like at your company? Um, and no one knows how to answer that. So that's a good one to ask. Um, <laughs> and in terms of like the vague job description, again, I think that's personal preference. I actually love a vague job description because in my experience, I've been able to make the role what I want it to be, but that is not everyone's experience. And I've absolutely <laughs> seen where it bites other people. Um, so you kind of have to, again, I think that goes back to Ellie's point of asking like, Hey, this job description is pretty vague. Like, what are you really expecting or what are you looking for? Um, and see if they can narrow it down any. Uh, and then if time goes on and those responsibilities start to morph into something completely different, it was, it is very okay to say, Hey, uh, let's just kind of remember the conversations we had in our interviews. You know, I met with so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so, and this was the expectation. I feel like we're really taking a detour here. Can we reset? Uh, and I, I think that's well within, you know, a reasonable conversation to have with your employer. So um, all things personal preference and, and just ask for clarity if it's not, if you're not sure, or if you're like, oh, yellow flag. Yeah. Yeah. One of my, sorry, really quick. One of my favorite <laughs> stories from actually being a candidate myself was when I had a, I had a phone interview and they said, could you describe for us what you think the day-to-day -day of this job looks like? And I had studied the job description because I'm a, I'm a good candidate. I studied the job description. And I was ready to go. And I described exactly what I thought the role was based on the job description. And they go, yeah, well, that's not it at all. And um, that's our fault. So... <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like completely thrown for a loop. And oh, I was like, gosh. okay, so, okay, got it. Um, that's, <laughs> I'm so glad I studied the wrong job description this entire time. Um, oh, my gosh. So, yeah, that's a funny little anecdote. Anecdote for what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, I had applied for a position once where it gave me the salary range in the job description. I went in, I had to do a presentation to a group, and I had to, um, do an interview, like a panel interview with the group too. Before I even started the presentation, which was first, the, the lead person pulled me over to the side and said, hey, I need to tell you something. And I was like, okay. And they're like, 
the salary was incorrect on the posting. And I was like, what is the salary? And the range was like half. And my heart just died because I'm like, I can't live on that. Like, that's not sustainable for me. Like, even what I was going to take for that role was like a major cut from where I was. I continued to go on. But later on, I'm like, I almost feel like I should have been like, this isn't for me and like left. Um, But one thing I wanted to ask, Katie, you had mentioned salary too, and being able to ask the recruiter for clarification on that. Because I feel like I would say 20 years ago, you know, I would apply for a job and I know other people would too. And they would not know because it wasn't, you know, as open and transparent. It is a lot more now today, maybe not completely. Um, But apply for a job and kind of look up, try to get salary ideas and things like that. Well, I got on a call with the recruiter and one of their questions in that first call was, what are your salary expectations? And I felt so weird because I was like, I'm not supposed to talk to her about this. Like she's immediately going to say, you're not a person for this because you want too much money. So that's reassuring that you're saying that now that you can have that conversation. And it really just helps you to, if it's not in your range that you need to be in, then you have that time to go find something else and that you're not, you know, taking up their time or having some false hope, you know, moving forward. So thank you for saying that. Yeah, I have a couple of tips on that specifically. So the first being, if the re- if the recruiter asks you in that way before any other type of conversation about salary, it's okay for you to say, you know what, uh, my range is kind of flexible. I know where I want to land, but I'd love to hear what you have budgeted for the role currently. Um, they need to tell you that. Secondly, just in case anybody who actually does hiring is listening to this, Um, It is actually a huge DEI effort to share salary before asking a candidate because we know that underrepresented groups typically undercut themselves salary wise. So I always say, always in every single phone screen that I do before the candidate tells me what they expect, I say, hey, so and so the salary for this role is budgeted somewhere between X and X based on experience. Here are some of our bonus things. Da 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 da. Based on that, is that salary going to meet your needs? Because I am not, what we're not going to do is let people come in, you know, 50K under what I know our company's offering. And, you know, in a past role, I did have, and especially women, and that's why I'm so passionate about helping women with their confidence, but they would say, you know, oh my gosh, that salary is more than I've ever made in my whole entire life. And I would say, That is so exciting for you. Never repeat that again to anyone at this company. Mm. And they would say, what do you mean? And I say, nope, I'm on your side, girl. But we're not going to say that again because (laughs) you're going to get paid somewhere in that range because that's fair market value. Mm -hmm. End of story. That's the whole story. And they're like, what? Okay. Uh, And so (laughs) um, just, you know, I just really, I always encourage and hiring managers do not like it, especially if they're not used to it. But um, when I explain it from the perspective of the candidate and, and why I do it, why I'm so passionate about it, um, I think they kind of just know I'm going to do it anyway. But I, I always <laughs> expect, I expect recruiters to share that information. It's not secret. Why would you not? We're just wasting everyone's time. So if right. a recruiter does ask you and you, if you feel comfortable, like I feel comfortable saying, this is where I want to be. I know that this is fair market value. Have a great day. But if you don't know or you don't know the recruiter or you're unsure, it's fine to say, you know what? My range is kind of flexible. I'd love to hear what you're offering. What is the budgeted salary for this role? And they'll answer you. I like that question. Yeah, there was a a role that I had looked at and the salary was a lot lower than what I had had previously. But I was like, oh, this sounds so interesting. Like it's in my area of passion. Like, you know, trying to figure out like I could do it. And they they came back and they're like, this is the range. Like, is that okay? And I had told somebody else, I was like, they're probably thinking like, what is wrong with you that you would like accept something this low? And my response to go back was as long as it's not full-time in the office, because they weren't clear on the job description, whether it could, you know, be hybrid, remote, whatever. And so they came back and they said, there is the opportunity for hybrid unless you're working on a special project. And I was like, well, in that case, yes, I am comfortable with it. But you know, otherwise not. So being able to ask those clarifying questions, that's really good. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, let me see. Let me go on to AI and technology. Um, so that is like with ChatGPT, uh, with Bard, with like all these different tools. We were even talking before we jumped on here about some different tools for social media. Um, how do you think AI and technology are changing the recruiting landscape? I don't, I don't even, uh, I don't know. There's so much conversation around it, to be honest. Um, I will say that I love what AI can do for individuals who are trying to write their resume or um, trying to get ideas of like, oh, what metrics do I have as a teacher? And they can go to chat GPT and say like, hey, can you give me some examples of some metrics that a teacher might add to their resume? And they can kind of go through and like be like, oh, that doesn't apply. But oh, that I did that. Like, how can I make that for me? I love that it supports people in that way. I'm not loving some of the very obviously AI written <laughs> things that I'm receiving um, that are clearly not truthful. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with using AI for support, but like edit it to be true for you. Like, otherwise it doesn't make sense. But in terms of like recruitment, you know, I mentioned like it's helping with sourcing. It's allowing us to find candidates a little differently, maybe a little quicker. Um, some people are using it for like, uh, I, I recently read about recruiters using it for like a, an initial phone conversation. Like the, the voice that you're talking to is an AI voice. Blows my mind. I would never. Like our company would never do that because how do you... I, I don't know. Um, anyway, so there's lots of advances. Do I think that they will all be implemented and all work super well? No. Um, do I think that recruiters will be out of a job because of it? Also, no. Um, there's a really human element to the hiring process, or, or should be, um, that I think, I think AI is going to be great in terms of how it can help support, but I don't think that it will replace, um, and there will be a hundred recruiters who respond and say that I'm wrong and that, you know, AI is just the way of the future. And that's great. And again, I think it can be helpful, but I think it's just going to be a tool in our toolbox and there will still have to be the human component. Okay. Thank you. Ellie, do you have anything to add there? Yeah. My whole perspective on this is that i'm not sure I, I think i just had a connectivity issue sorry okay i think that's I'm back. okay yeah, um, you're, going, you're good now my, the the thing that i see happening okay, okay. <laughs> the thing that i see happening is that um there is a craving for authenticity now and it has become increasingly harder to trust someone without having a one-on-one -on -one live conversation with them because even in chats, because now you can't even ch trust anybody in a chat. You don't know if they wrote it or if ChatGPT wrote it. Um, and like like Katie said, like you're tired of seeing the clearly AI written resumes. That's a cr that's craving for authenticity. You're craving um, more human connection. So what I see in my prediction is that the people who will get ahead are the people who have more conversations through networking, um, who are willing to jump on Zoom calls to chat with people. Um, that requires a lot more time and energy than your typical LinkedIn chat, but that's how you're going to stand out because the, the hiring team is craving that authenticity from you. Um, and yeah, that that is what I what I predict for for the future. I mean, I I hope that that human element stick, sticks around, like you talked about, Katie. I think it is absolutely critical that we that we keep the humanity in the hiring process. Yeah, love that, love that. Yeah, and I absolutely agree. AI is supplemental. I don't think yeah. it replaces at all. Yeah. Okay. Um, so before we go on to our kind of second to last question, because I know we're getting close on time here, um, if anybody is listening live, which I think we have one or two people, um, if you have any questions at all, feel free to throw them in the comments um, and we'll do our best to answer those in the, the final few minutes here. If not, Ellie and Katie are both in our group and at a later point in time, if you guys want to revisit the you know the comments um, and provide some input, that would be awesome. Um, but so our second 
second to last before I let you share like where we can connect with you outside of this episode. Um, what would you say are some common mistakes that you see job seekers make and how could they, they avoid those? Like, are there simple, maybe general mistakes that you're seeing? I think the simplest, simplest fix for people is to tailor their resume to meet the job description. And I, I know that it is frustrating when you're applying for so many different things. Like I get it. I really do. But I have a very diverse professional background. I have a lot of experience and a lot of different things. I have to tailor my resume to fit what I'm applying for. So if I'm applying for a nonprofit development position, I'm going to focus a lot on the grants that I wrote and my success in that field. And I'm not going to talk as much about my recruiting KPIs because that's not relevant to the role. I think what has really kind of tripped me up lately when I'm reviewing resumes is a skill could even be in the title. Like, it could be that specific and people have it nowhere in their resume. And I read the resume through and through. I go back through I go back, and I'm like, what am I missing here? Like this person. And I just don't see any connection. And so my advice would be one, tailor your resume to the job you're applying to. But two, if you are making like some kind of pivot, I'm here for it. I love a good career leap, but that is a good time to either use the summary statement at the top of your resume or a cover letter. I know that, A lot of people say they hate cover letters, but I think in this example, it's a perfect excuse to use one. If you are pivoting and maybe you've taken some coursework or something, or like you've gotten some certifications to make that pivot a little easier, or you want to talk about your transferable skills, put it in a cover letter so that I, as the recruiter can read through it and be like, oh, that they did understand what this role was. Because if you're applying with a bunch of experience that doesn't feel aligned or doesn't seem to meet any of what was on the job description, Honestly, sometimes I read it and I'm like, I think I think they applied to the wrong thing. But if there's some background that I'm missing, put it in the cover letter, put it in that summary statement at the top. I help people write resumes specifically for transition a lot. And that is the piece I think that is missing. Like, it's okay to like put a couple sentences at the top in your summary about why you're looking to transition or what you've done to support that transition. Um, So I think that's the simplest fix. Like meet the list the requirements, meet the, the needs of the role um, so that the recruiter knows why why you're in their APS in the first place. <laughs> I love that. Great advice. Uh, my, my addition to that is get out of your own way. Um, <laughs> I know, Katie, if you're not in your head hard because you feel this, um, you acknowledge and accept your power accept your strengths and be so ready and willing to talk about them. Even if that feels weird, it feels unlike anything you've ever done before. You have to be confident in yourself because confidence sells. Confidence gets offers. That doesn't mean that you're going to wake up tomorrow and be (laughs) perfect. That doesn't mean you're going to wake up tomorrow and be confident. It might mean that you need to do some serious mindset work or maybe even like mental health work if if needed um, to get yourself in that place so that you can be powerful and get that powerful job that you deserve. I love it. I'm Gosh, what a way to end us. <laughs> Say that again, Katie. I'm doing cartwheels inside. That was so good. <laughs> <laughs> and for those who listen later on for the audio for the podcast, Katie had held up her sweatshirt that says confident at work. That's what we were kind of giggling about. So, yeah. All right. So I wish we had more time because I feel like we could all talk for hours about this topic. We even had more questions that we didn't quite get to. Um, but I I just want to acknowledge and thank both of you, Ellie and Katie, for sharing this time with us and even sharing the prep time um, about talking about these items and doing this live and on camera. Um, We'll also have an audio on the podcast here um, in the coming week or two. Um, But before we go, I want to give both of you an opportunity. If um, somebody who's listening wants to get in contact with you, talk to you a little bit more, um, maybe uh, partake in some of the services that you offer in your career coaching, um, would you share the best way to connect with you? We'll start with Ellie. 
Sure. Yep. LinkedIn. That's the best way to connect with me. I'm on there every business day. Um, and then it's Ellie Hokeman, E-L-L-I-E-H-O-E-K-M-A-N. Awesome. Thank you. And Katie? Yeah. So um, email info at hercareerconfidence.com. Um, Instagram, Her Career Confidence. Um, and also I am also on LinkedIn every day. Uh, it's an occupational hazard and that is just, it's Katie, K-A-I-T-I-E dash Marie talent. So Katie Marie dash talent, uh, on LinkedIn. Um, but honestly her career confidence, you'll, you'll find me on a lot of platforms and, and, uh, be able to send a message that way. They are a little um, brand new, so don't be alarmed by the lack of content yet, but um, it's, it's, coming. <laughs> a, it's a new and exciting endeavor. So that's the, the best way to reach me and uh, happy to chat services or support in any way I can. Awesome. Awesome. I'll put these in the comments in the group and then also in the description when we roll out the uh, audio podcast. Um, so thank you both again. I appreciate, again, your time, your energy, your excitement over this topic. I know sometimes it's a little bit grueling for other people uh, to think about, but you live and breathe this um, in both your recruiting experience and your career coaching. And I really, really appreciate that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Bye -bye. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. And we'll see you next time.